Thanks very much. And uh, Jane Hudlicker, welcome from Brisbane. Thanks, Andrew. You feel like a very long way away at the moment. <laughs> It's good. it's good to have you. And I, I, want to, I want to begin by talking about the October declaration by IATA that the airline industry is going to reach net zero emissions by 2050. From, from your perspective, Australia, is this the right strategy? Is this the only strategy for the airline industry to survive and thrive? I really don't think we have a choice, Andrew, but to commit to zero emissions by 2050. We've all got an obligation to do the very best job we can in protecting the environment, and protecting um, our futures. And so I think we have no choice. It's just a matter of making sure that we architect our pathways to that so that we don't find ourselves in a position where we get to 2030 and 2050 feels too close. Well, talking about pathways, what at this stage is is Virgin's uh, pathway? How are you going to get to that sort of emissions target? Well, we're very realistic about the challenges associated with getting to 2050, Andrew. And while we believe that sustainable aviation fuels are an essential piece of the puzzle, there's a lot more to it than that. And in fact, getting to sustainable aviation fuels as the mechanism to really dramatically reduce our carbon emissions. There's a long journey to get that done. And particularly in Australia, we don't have a SAP industry yet. And so, so our job right now is to make sure we've got a clear pathway to be able to participate in SAP. And in 2013, uh, we declared our intention to explore um, sustainable aviation fuels. In 2018, we had our first test flights. Uh, we were the first in Australia to do that. So we're absolutely committed. It's a fundamental part of our brand to be innovators. We're absolutely committed to that journey. That's not good enough because waiting until then means we have not done the job we could do in the short term. And what do I mean by that? Well, every single day we have single use plastics that are used in parts of our operation. We need to get rid of that entirely, making sure we're using recyclable um, disposable items. Uh, making sure that all of our ground activity is done with zero emissions and we're using um, sustainable fuels throughout our processes wherever that's possible, working with all of our partners to ensure end-to-end -end we're thinking through supply chain opportunities, offsetting our carbon emissions where that's practical and feasible to do without um, you know, wrecking the industry. Um, we have to look at every single lever in the mix of emissions and offsets to try to get as close to zero emissions well before 2050, wherever that's possible. Well, as you point out, there is no SAP industry to speak of in Australia. Um, this is something that airlines obviously cannot develop on their own. So what would you like to see from the Australian government as far as policy incentives to, to kickstart, if you like, a SAP industry, or is the SAP industry even a, a realistic prospect? Well, you know, I think everybody understands that it's expensive. And so no airline or, or handful of airlines can do this on their own. We need government support to ensure that the seed capital that's needed, the funding to get up to scale is there and available, that the tax offsets are there to motivate that investment cycle. And so we're, we're doing our bit working with the Australian government to find creative solutions to get the ball rolling. You know, we see great things happening in the US. We're really buoyed by that because we think some of those first mover um, investments that have been made elsewhere in the world will also increase the odds of success in Australia because we can learn from others. And then the costs of experimentation are a bit lower, the, the cost of innovation are a bit lower. And we can partner with others to, to make headway you know, more quickly than we might otherwise be able to do. But we're a long way from everyone else. And so we're very conscious of the fact that we need to get a scale industry developed and we need to do that when it's feasible to do so. And we have to do that with support from other stakeholders, including government. Mm, yeah, as you point out, Australia is a long way away. It's, it's got a vibrant industry, an airline industry. Uh, but, but is it going to be a, a tougher path, do you think, for, for companies like Virgin Australia to, to, to hit those zero emissions compared to, say, something like the US? Or, or you can't really say that at this stage. I think it's a bit too early to call it. What I would expect to see happen, Andrew, is that sustainable aviation fuels get to scale and the economics get 
to a point where they're um, scale approachable for all the airlines. And when 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 that curve starts to move in the right direction, all those first movers are going to be looking at the opportunities that exist globally that haven't yet been delivered. And so I would fully expect that we'd have companies arriving here who've been there and done that, who want to leverage the technology and capability that they have elsewhere, knowing that they've got a ready market for the output and hungry to participate in the in the opportunity. So that's what I would hope to see happen. I think for us to be on the cutting edge is pretty hard because the scale opportunity on the other side just isn't the same as it will be in Europe and as it will be in the US. And so there are just some practicalities here that we have to be um, clear about so that we're not committing to things that practically are not achievable in the timeframes you know, that we have. But I think 2050 is a realistic time frame, and we need to be encouraging innovation and keeping our eye closely on what's happening in other markets so that we are top of the list for innovators to consider once they've got technology that's proven and they, they know they can get it to scale. We, we certainly know it's been it's been tough for the airlines, uh, yours particularly uh, with, with the pandemic. As, as you have no emerge administration and as you begin to grow again, is it going to be tougher for you, given that your eye has to be on the bottom line, to introduce uh, sustainability projects into the airline? I actually think in some ways, Andrew, it's easier because we've had the opportunity to clean up our balance sheet and to build a really strong airline for the future. And it's core to our brand to ensure that we're doing the right thing by all of our key stakeholders, which includes the environment. So we're passionate about this. We absolutely intend to be successful at it. And I think it's I think it's actually a help because we've had the benefit of restructuring right in the midst of the pandemic and the financial wherewithal that we, we now have gives us the, the ability to, to see the journey through. So I, I'm pretty worried about it. I think the central issue that we have, which all other airlines have already started to go through, is we have to rebuild demand. Particularly in Australia, you know, the, the international borders have been shut, the domestic borders have largely been shut, consumers have not been traveling for the last four or five months. Now as borders start to reopen here and we start to learn how to live with COVID, we have to teach consumers the value in travel again. We have to really create incentives to get back out and in the air and exploring this great country. And so job one is to rebuild demand so that we can bowl you back in the industry. And that's a big job to be done. And it probably takes us 12 plus months as an industry to get everything back to balance so that we get the volume and then we get the margins and the pricing back. But volume has to be built first and then the rest will come as capacity and supply sort of start to rebalance. And, and as we go through that, we have to get back to that point where we've got everything in balance before you can then put discretionary investment into these other really important projects that are critical for the medium term but they're not vital for this short-term 12-month period where we've all, all got to get back and get the P&L as strong as the balance sheet. You mentioned earlier, and it, it, it's a fact that uh, SAF, for example, is, is at this stage a much more expensive fuel. Do you think that the passenger will at some stage have to pay more for their flights? Generally, this is a question we're asking all CEOs uh, because of the cost of SAF. Um, at, or, or do you see a scenario where you can get enough critical mass to drive the price down to sort of parity with fossil fuels? Uh, so therefore, passengers won't have to fork out more for their for their travel. Well, look, uh, having been in all corners of our industry, it's really important that prices stay sharp in order to get the volume in the industry. And if prices structurally go up, because the cost of fuel is higher. We've seen what's happened in high fuel um, periods in our cycle when fossil fuels are really, really expensive. And the volume just comes down because it's too expensive for people to travel. So there's a, there's a practical side to this, which we just have to be mindful of. And I think consumers will increasingly be conscious of their own carbon footprints and want to ensure that they're making good decisions with respect to carbon footprint, but they've got a capacity to pay, which is has boundaries on it. And if every single thing they buy, they have to pay more for, they have less capacity to consume. 
And so it's our obligation to try to find ways to offset our footprint and to use sustainable aviation fuels. It's our obligation to try to find ways to get the cost down on all of this so that we can keep the volume up while reducing our emissions and keeping consumers happy and delighted to be out and exploring the world um, at the same time and feeling good about the decisions that they're making from the standpoint of the impact they're having on the environment. I'd hate to see aviation go back to a place where it's so expensive to travel that it's only really affordable for upper middle class and wealthy uh, consumers. That, that would be a devastating thing, I think, for the world. It may be that we have no choice and we end up there, but I'm the eternal optimist and I would love to see all of our creative energy, all that great innovation capability going into finding ways to get the economics to a point where it's a no-brainer. Everybody wants to use sustainable fuels, not just in aviation, but everywhere. And we're experimenting with more electric sources of um, movement. And we, we, get the, we get the costs down so that we can keep people in the air and moving around the world. Well, just on that point, uh, you, you say that uh, people are obviously becoming more and more aware of their own carbon footprints. Do you think there's a lack of awareness amongst passengers at this stage about what the airlines are actually doing and what they're promising to deliver as far as sustainability goes? I do think that's probably the case. Now, I think we're having this conversation at an odd time in the industry because we've all been very focused on standing down our people and hibernating our aircraft and then taking advantage of opportunities to fly and getting back out there and then doing it all again. And we haven't been as focused as an industry in speaking to consumers about the things that actually matter because the whole world's been upside down. I think the next 12 months is going to be still a period of renorming. And then consumers are going to start to care again about those things that really do speak to things that matter to them at the core. And it's our job during that period to start to get the narrative right and to engage with consumers in a way that helps them realize the, act, the consequence of their actions and what we're doing to help them. Jane Hurtlicker, thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure, Andrew.